decision. Sensing Steve might be willing to talk, Detective Martinez started the interview slowly. But would Steve open up? I started talking to Steve, and, and, and I'm not hitting on the murder itself. I'm asking him about who you dated, who you married. He starts naming off ex-girlfriends, the next wife. He doesn't come up with the name of the West End. But he kind of turns over that. The stakes were high. Convinced he was face-to-face -face with Barbara's killer, but with no physical evidence, Detective Martinez knew a confession was critical. His plan was to... Deadly night three years earlier. 
one evening, Marlboro started complaining. So he went off the store to get her some beer. When he gets back and Barbara sees the type of beer that he bought, she flies off the handle. Why do you come back with such cheap beer? Steve admitted an argument exploded into a flurry of violence. Barbara hit him, and that really upset him. He grabbed a knife sharpener and hit Barbara in the head. She fell on the dog, and the dog was crying. He was just overcome with rage. He grabbed a pipe wrench, and he started hitting her in the head. And then once he saw that, that she was dead, and the dog is still yapping, and he said that he hit the dog to take it out of his misery. and then place a plastic bag over that dog's head and twisted a wire ligature around its neck until it died. He wrapped both of them up in a blanket and the only thing he can think of, there was a hole being used as a septic tank. So he dropped them inside the septic tank. so upsetting you're disposing of somebody in a most inhumane way and then you kill her pet dog and you dump him in the sewer too it's very cruel three years after burying his darkest secret in the backyard of his parents home steve swain was arrested he pled not guilty and eventually stood trial for the murder of Barbara Weston. I just remember sitting outside those courtroom doors every day thinking, who does that? Who takes somebody? Who kills a dog? The jury came back with second degree murder, and Steve was sentenced to 16 years to life. never wanted him to get out of prison and the attorney felt strongly that he never will i was happy with anything that would take him off the streets and, and keep him put away i didn't want this to happen to anybody else it's unusual for people to get buried in the backyard but some way somehow that victim is going to be discovered to go from nothing to make an arrest and have a final conclusion of a conviction and say nothing perpetrated to prison, that is satisfying. The senseless murder and appalling burial of Barbara Weston and her dog has forever changed the town of Little Rock, California, and yet it keeps on. We recovered really well from it, and a lot of positive things came out of it. Today, a lot of people communicate with each other. A lot of people look out after each other. As for Barbara's daughters, they look after their mom's memory. It was almost poetic that Willie was there with her, and it was Willie that helped people know who they were. Without Willie, who knows if they would have been able to identify her. They know her grace and beauty would have continued to blossom with each passing year. I can say this with a very full heart that I know she loved us. We lived in some strange circumstances sometimes and had some strange things go on. But you know what? We're all good people and successful people. And I think... My mom did a fabulous job with what she had. My mom is a perfect example that people can make a lot of bad decisions, but people can change. And I would have loved to have seen the grandmother that she was going to be.
For more information... In March of 2009, a cadaver dog tracked a trail of death in a Virginia backyard. For the body to be just discarded like that was really pretty shocking. The discovery sent investigators down a bizarre road. He's in the middle of a bunch of outlaw bikers, and I'm going to sick the police on that group of people. We've got lie after lie after lie. Social security money from two men was still going into a different account. This was salacious. We just both basically said at the same time, I think we have another box. Who were these two victims? Now it's like our heads are spinning. And who had been hiding the deadly truth? The body did not have a head. As a reporter, I'm going to go March of 2009, investigative reporter A.J. Legault received a tip about a developing story in the backyard of a Louisa County, Virginia home. I got a text saying, we're going to be out looking for a body on this property. You might want to get a camera out here. Louisa County, being a largely rural county, doesn't have a lot of crime. So regardless of whether it's a murder, we knew there was a story here that we wanted to get to the bottom of. By the time Legault arrived, police had already secured the area of the expansive yard. The veteran reporter sensed a huge story was about to break. It's not every day that you have a big news story in Louisa County. My reporter alarm bells are definitely going off. I was thinking, I want to find out just what's going on, but we had no idea just how strange this was going to get. From behind the police tape, he and other reporters watched a cadaver dog sniffing for the unmistakable scent of death. It looked like it had a purpose, like it was on to something. Investigators hung on hope that a mystery that had been plaguing them for months was about to be solved. This case has is, is got to be the craziest case that I've ever had to work. You always hear about it in other communities, but never in your own backyard. In November of 2007, Lee Bowles arrived in Virginia to celebrate the Thanksgiving holiday with his dad, Cody. I made a phone call to my dad to find out what time Thanksgiving was going to be. Lisa, my dad's girlfriend, answered and was like, oh, your dad's not here. She just said that he met a friend and they went on a bike ride to Sturgis in South Dakota. If he was going to go all the way across the country and do something which would be a super exciting thing, he would have told me. Family was really important to him. That was probably the most important thing to him. But my dad, he did love riding bikes. Even after he had his heart attack, they put a pacemaker in. And he still continued to get out and do things. He had his heart attack when I was 10. I knew that he had a heart condition at a young age. So every time I went to visit him, I didn't know if that was going to be the last time. Lee was surprised and disappointed when he left that weekend without seeing his dad. That's not like him. He wouldn't just stand everybody up for Thanksgiving. Days turned into months, and with no word from Cody, Lee and his two siblings started to get concerned. We were calling Lisa, and we were like, what's going on? Have you seen him? And she said he got in with some kind of militia group or anti-governmental type of group, and he was hanging out with them, and, you know... They were an illegal operation, biker gang. Lee got a sinking feeling. Maybe his dad had gone off the grid with the wrong group of guys. He's a biker. He's a motorcycle guy. And I did notice in the last few years he got to be more of a conspiracy theory type of person. 
I don't particularly want to call the police on him. Like, he's in the middle of a bunch of, you know, outlaw bikers, and I'm going to sick the police on that group of people. What do you think they're going to do to him? Though worried, Lee held off getting in touch with authorities, because surely his dad would reach out eventually. But after about a year and still no word from Cody, Lee finally made the call he knew he should have made long ago. I made a phone call to the police department and filed a report. Lee was concerned about his father and his father's health. Several years before, his father had a heart attack and was on approximately, said, 10 medications. Needed these medications on a daily basis. And he said that they always had a good relationship. And it was quite out of character for him not to stay in contact with them. Hoping to make better sense of the situation, detectives Howard Porter and Carlton Johnson paid a visit to Cody's live-in girlfriend, Ulyssa Shavers. She offered investigators the same story she shared with Lee. She told us that he had gone to Sturgis for a motorcycle rally, uh, met with some motorcycle gang out there that's involved in the militia, and that uh, he left and traveled back out there to stay with them. So said he wouldn't contact his family because you know, he was upset with them. You know, he thought that they were just trying to take advantage of him, trying to borrow money from them, and he wanted less responsibilities. The detectives felt like they may have just stepped into the middle of a family drama. I gave her my business card with my cell phone number on it, and I told her when she hears from Cody, have him call me so we can get this issue cleared up. For detectives... Was he intentionally avoiding contact with his family? Or could he be in harm's way? We started looking into the files just to make sure he hadn't been arrested somewhere or he hasn't uh, been in an accident. After that, we started looking at driver's licenses and bank accounts. And also, we started working with the Social Security Administration as he was receiving Social Security checks. So we wanted to see if was he uh, receiving money out west? How was he living? Where was his Social Security check going? Were Cody's Social Security checks still being cashed? Turns out it was going into his bank account. So then at that point, at least we know he's alive, he's doing okay, and he's out there on his own. The detectives delivered the news to Ulyssa. And surprisingly, she had some news of her own to share. She said that Cody had stopped by with a friend of his. Came in Christmas Eve, stayed the night, and left out Christmas Day. And I asked why. You know, he didn't call me. She goes, he didn't want to. He doesn't does want to have any contact with any kind of law enforcement. She told us that. When the sawdust settles and the engine finally roars, the thing you care about most is a job well done. But when you get your tools from Harbor Freight, something about the job feels a little different. Your wallet. 
Because we believe no matter what you're working on, you need high quality tools at a great price. And that's what we have in stock here. So whatever you do, do it for less at Harbor Freight. Quality tools, lowest prices. Dad, you're supposed to be giving me a hand. Looks like you've already got it covered. Getting your outdoor space looking great is easy at Jerome's. And with Jerry's Price, you get incredible values every day. Like our in-stock Maldives dining set, made with weather-resistant solid eucalyptus wood. Or get this entire Myrtle outdoor living room set for under $1,000. Plus, check out our five-year special financing and next-day delivery on in-stock items. Only at Jerome's. A Florida State University graduate by the name of Rachel Morningstar Hoffman was placed under drug court supervision after officers found cannabis in her possession during a traffic stop on February the 22nd of 2007. In April of the following year, Tallahassee police conducted a search of the young woman's apartment where they discovered more cannabis as well as four ecstasy pills. She consequently faced criminal charges, but the authorities gave her the opportunity to serve as a police informant to avoid a possible prison sentence. Hoffman agreed, and she was subsequently tasked with obtaining 1,500 ecstasy pills, two ounces of cocaine, and two handguns, which violated department policy with $13,000 in a buy-bust operation. On the day of the sting, Hoffman went to the agreed-upon location to meet with a pair of suspects with two narcotics officers monitoring her movements. However, the dealers made a sudden change to the location of the buy. Hoffman was urged not to follow them, but technical issues with the police's equipment prevented her from receiving those instructions. Her handlers lost track of her when she reportedly left with the two suspects in a stolen BMW. She was then gunned down by the dealers with one of the firearms she was supposed to purchase. In the aftermath, the Tallahassee Police Department came under fire for sending Hoffman out into the field, despite not having any undercover training or knowledge of either cocaine or guns. The officers involved were suspended with pay, and the victim's family filed a wrongful death suit against the city, which was ultimately settled for a reported $2.6 million. On December the 17th of 2009, what would have been Hoffman's 25th birthday, the two suspects identified as Danilo R. Bradshaw and Andrea Jabbar Green were found guilty of murder. Both were given life sentences. In May of 2009, the Florida State Senate passed new legislation dubbed Rachel's Law, which introduced new requirements for law enforcement agencies recruiting confidential informants. Number six, Victor Castro Martinez. 25-year-old Victor Castro Martinez, an admitted member of the international gang known as MS-13, agreed to cooperate with the police in 2018 as part of a larger investigation into the notorious group. On the evening of June the 6th, Martinez informed his police contact that he was meeting with other MS-13 members at 7600 Long Drive near Cullinan Park, in Houston, Texas. The following morning, the informant's mutilated body was found in the park, with the police's audio recording device still in his pocket. It was determined that he perished within 30 minutes of sending his final text message to his handler. During the ensuing homicide investigation, it emerged that Martinez had been ambushed by at least seven gang members identified as Wilson Jose Ventura Mejia, Jimmy Villalobos Gomez, Angel Miguel Aguilar Ochoa, Walter Antonia Chiquez Garcia, Marlon Miranda Moran, Franklin Trejo Chavarria, and Carlos Elias Enriquez Torres. The assailants allegedly took turns butchering the victim with a machete because of his ties to the other Each indicted on federal charges in connection with the case with the possibility of receiving the death Number five, Javier Garcia. 22-year-old Tony Guys Jr. was the victim of a fatal gang-related shooting on September the 27th of 2000. He was reportedly gunned down as he sat in a brown Datsun vehicle in Pittsburgh, California. Although the case went cold for several years thereafter, the police broke new ground 
In the investigation, after conducting an interview with a man believed to have been a witness to the shooting in 2019, a 46-year-old Elk Grove resident named Paia Tassini was asked to provide a statement in support of the authorities' efforts to identify Geis' killer. Tassini obliged, but in doing so, in the... Did you ever wonder why this became what dogs eat for every meal? In 1860, a lightning rod salesman called James Spratt spotted dogs eating hardtack. A shelf-stable cracker used his military rations, and he got a big idea. He started making Spratt's meat feed brine dog cakes, a mix of wheat, vegetables, beef, and the dried, unsalted, gelatinous parts of prairie beef. Yum. Spratt's knack for marketing made the cakes a hit. In the 1920s, canned horse meat briefly overtook dried food, but when World War II brought rations on tin and meat, dried pellets, or kibble, took over as standard dog food. And that was pretty much it for the next 58 years. Kibble can be made with things like leftover scraps, added starches, and other ingredients that are subject to multiple rounds of high heat, high pressure processing. And to make a product looks like this. Kibble can even include diseased and decaying meats via a process called rendering, which sterilizes them and produces the powdered substance you see on pet food labels called meal. The history of kibble was about human convenience and true marketing and dogs got the short end of the stick. Eh, not in the fun way. But now real dog food is back. If you want to try feeding... Today's story is a skydiving disaster story. However, it does not go the way you think it will. And at the end of today's video, there is a very special call to action that is connected to the main story that I think many of you will be very excited to participate in, but no pressure. However, before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please sneak in to the like button's house and and swap out their cat for an identical looking cat. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. On the morning of August 1st, 2009, 44-year-old skydiving instructor David Hartsock pulled into the parking lot of Skydive Houston in Texas and then made his way inside. A few minutes later, and Dave, like the rest of his colleagues, was hard at work getting ready for the day before the facility opened up and the inevitable weekend rush began. Skydive Houston is actually just a private airport, and it's not really in Houston. It's located about 30 miles to the northwest of Houston in a city called Waller. The main facility of Skydive Houston is situated right up against this huge open airfield that basically looks like a big green grass field. And the main facility itself is comprised of several large buildings, one of which is a huge hangar that contains the Super Twin Otter airplanes, which are the little aircraft that bring the skydivers up so they can jump out. Because Skydive Houston offers something called tandem jumping, it gets a lot of first-time jumpers. Tandem jumping is when a skydiving student attaches to the front of their instructor. Literally, they're buckled onto them, and then the two of them leap out of the plane together with the student never detaching from the instructor. This method allows the student to just kind of go along for the ride and have no responsibility while the instructor who's attached to them does everything. They make sure they're both stable in the air. They're the ones that pull the ripcord to deploy the chute. They're the ones that land them safely on the ground. And so obviously tandem jumping really appeals to first time jumpers. Dave had finished his three year long training course to become a certified skydiving instructor just a few months earlier. But even prior to going through this course, Dave was already a very experienced skydiver with over 800 jumps to his credit. And the reason he had so many jumps is because Dave loved skydiving. It had given his life a focus that really nothing else ever had. Dave had always been a kind of average guy. He lived in a very modest house in a suburb of Houston, and for much of his life, he had worked very normal blue-collar jobs, like he had been a cook at two different chain restaurants, he had managed a grocery store, and he also had worked at a soda bottling plant. Dave was divorced and had no kids, but he had a really good group of friends who liked to go to bars and go bowling and play darts. And while Dave was never really unhappy with the way his life was going, as he started to creep into his 40s, he couldn't help but think, you know, I haven't really done anything big or important in my life. 
And so, in 2004, not long after Dave got divorced, one of his good friends asked him if he wanted to go skydiving with him to celebrate that friend's 40th birthday. And Dave immediately thought to himself, this is it. This is a chance to do something big with my life. And so he told the friend, yes, I'd love to go. And after that first jump that Dave did with his friend, Dave was hooked. Whenever Dave was falling through the sky at over 100 miles per hour, it was like nothing else in the whole world even existed. Life became very simple and beautiful. The manager at Skydive Houston saw Dave come in every weekend for years to do all these jumps, and finally he just offered Dave a job. And so that was how Dave left the soda bottling plant to become a skydiving instructor. So, August 1st, 2009 was a Saturday, and Saturdays at Skydive Houston were incredibly busy. Basically, non-stop tandem jumps all day. Whenever Dave was not working, so he was jumping on his own, he would always pack his own parachute because, like many other skydivers, he liked to make sure it was done exactly right. But when Dave was working, especially on Saturdays when it was so crazy busy, he didn't have time to pack and repack his parachute after every single jump because he was constantly being sent up again and again and again to take another student. And so instead, he would take one of the pre-packed parachutes that were left out for instructors inside of their clubhouse. That particular Saturday in August of 2009 went very quickly, with Dave going up one after another with different students and jumping out and pulling the chute and landing safely over and over again. And then finally, at the end of the day, right around 4 o'clock, when Dave was getting ready to be done for the day, his manager came up to him and said, hey, do you mind doing one more tandem jump? And even though Dave was really exhausted, he's dripping sweat, it's super hot outside, he'd done six jumps that day, which was a lot, he said, no problem. Well, it's that time of the year again, which means the big game is right around the corner. Right now, trillions of people are rushing to their local owlries to get their mitts on the perfect winged beast for their game day buffalo owl dip. Meanwhile, me and old Long focus on what really counts on game day, and that's finger strength. Every day for the past 20 decades, me and Lungy have been waking up at 1 a.m. every day and putting our fingers through a grueling powerlifting routine so that on game day, when we fire up our gasoline-powered cell phones and load up our DraftKings Sportsbook app, as soon as we see the bets we like, our fingers are so jacked that when we tap on our screens, our fingers go through the phone. Now, does that ruin the phone? Yes. Is it worth it? I don't know. But it jacks us up. We're so... <laughs> now, does that ruin the phone? Yes. <laughs> now, does that ruin the phone? Yes. But is it worth it? Probably not. But it gets me and old Lonnie jacked up on game day. So, if you want to be a betting behemoth like me and old Long, then you better put that hooter back in the owlery and head to your local gym and start pumping some finger iron. Because this year, I'm teaming up with DraftKings to give all new customers a winning offer. All new customers have to do is sign up for DraftKings using my promo code, Mr. Ballin, and then bet at least $5 on the big game, and you will instantly receive an additional $200 in bonus bets. Yes, it really is that simple. New customers who bet $5 on the big game will get $200 extra dollars in bonus bets. Wondering what you could use that $200 in bonus bets on? You could try Same Game Parlays, where you combine multiple bets bets from one game, like which team will have the most passing yards and which team will have the first touchdown of the night for even bigger winnings. If mobile sports betting is not yet available in your state, don't worry, you can still get in on the fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use promo code MrBallin and bet $5 on the big game and get $200 instantly in bonus bets. Again, that's promo code MrBallin only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Okay, back to the story.
And so the manager introduced Dave to a short blonde woman who was visibly nervous named Shirley Diggert, who was there to celebrate her 54th birthday by skydiving for the first time. Her husband, her son, and her three grandkids were also there to watch her from the ground and take pictures. And her other son, who was celebrating his 30th birthday, he too was going skydiving. As soon as Dave walked up to Shirley, he grinned and stuck out his hand, and he made the same kind of corny joke he always made with nervous first-time jumpers, and that was, don't worry, you're going to be just fine, you're going to be strapped to me, and I'm not about to let anything happen to myself. And so Shirley laughed, and she did seem like she was a little bit at ease, and so Dave patted her on the shoulder, and then he walked over and he grabbed one of the pre-packed parachutes off the wall. These chutes actually contained two parachutes inside of the backpack. There was the main chute, which typically is the only chute that gets deployed on a jump, and then there was the reserve chute, which is a little bit smaller and is not normally used unless there's some sort of emergency where the main chute fails. After every jump, because the main chute has been deployed, it gets repacked and stuffed back into the backpack. But the reserve chute, because it almost never gets deployed, just stays packed. And so Skydive Houston, like basically every other skydiving facility, has certified technicians come in periodically to test the reserve chutes inside of the bag to make sure they're still packed exactly right. After grabbing the pre-packed parachute off the wall, Dave walked back over to Shirley, who was now in the staging area, putting on her flight suit. A flight suit is a single garment, kind of looks like a big onesie for an adult. And so Dave walked over, he put the parachute down, he tugged and pulled on her flight suit to make sure it was good, and then after he was satisfied, he picked the parachute back up and he signaled to Shirley, as well as Shirley's son, who was also skydiving, to follow him. And so the trio, they left the staging area, they went outside right to the airfield where there was a super twin otter idling and other jumpers were climbing on board to go for a jump. And so Dave, Shirley, and Shirley's son got in line, they boarded the plane, and a few minutes later, they were airborne. As the plane slowly climbed up to 13,500 feet, which is the jumping altitude, Shirley was sitting directly in front of Dave. They were on a bench seat on the back right of this little airplane. And Dave made a point of talking to Shirley and asking her where she was from and what she did to kind of ease her nerves. Shirley would tell Dave that this was not the kind of thing that she typically did. In fact, she told Dave that her other son, who was jumping with them, when he first decided he wanted to try skydiving a year earlier, she had desperately tried to talk him out of it, saying it was too dangerous. But recently, Shirley and her husband had decided that they needed to be more adventurous. They lived in a quiet town in rural Texas where Shirley was a mail carrier and her husband worked in a mine, and their lives were just kind of simple and very routine-oriented and kind of boring. So when Shirley's son, who was skydiving with them that day, had asked Shirley to go skydiving on her 54th birthday, she saw it as an opportunity to break the mold and do something adventurous, and so she said yes. And so Dave told Shirley about how he had discovered skydiving much the same way she had, and they really bonded over that. About 20 minutes after takeoff, all the tandem jumpers on the plane were now attached to their instructors, so Shirley was now buckled onto Dave. And then when they reached 13,500 feet, the jumping altitude, one of the instructors slid open the side door. It was time to jump. And the first one who was jumping was Shirley's son. And so from all the way back in the plane, Shirley called out to her son, have a good jump, I'll see you on the ground, as her son kind of waddled to the edge of the door with his instructor, and the two of them jumped out and disappeared into the air below. Next up was Shirley. So Dave told Shirley very calmly to stand up, and so they did. They stood up right next to their bench, and then before they waddled towards the exit, Dave, for what felt like the millionth time, checked to make sure he really was securely fastened onto Shirley, and then Dave tapped his ripcord right behind him, kind of like muscle memory, reminding himself where to go. He tapped his knife on his shoulder. He kind of just felt his equipment, and then feeling ready, he said, okay, Shirley, let's go. And then the two of them kind of waddled their way towards the front of the plane where that door was slid wide open, and then they turned, so Shirley's feet were right on the edge, basically looking out into the sky right outside. And so it's really Really loud, it's very windy, and Dave is right in Shirley's ear saying, okay, I'm going to count to three, and we're going to jump. 
And then Dave reached forward. He pulled Shirley's head back so she was looking up because he didn't want her to look down when they leapt out because for some people that will cause them to panic when they see the ground. And so with Shirley's head back, Dave very calmly said one, two, three, and then very gracefully, the two of them jumped out. From the moment you jump out of a plane at 13,500 feet until you touch the ground, it takes maybe two to three minutes with about 30 seconds to a minute of actual free fall. But that two to three minutes is so intense, it feels like it's 20 minutes long. And this was what Dave loved so much about skydiving, that intense presence you feel, that you're really in the moment. There's nothing else you can think about. It's just you careening through the sky towards the earth. It's incredible. Dave had actually had a number of close calls in his life. Like a few years earlier, he had been riding his motorcycle when somebody hit him in their car and he fractured his skull. And then not long after that accident, he was in another accident where he fractured his spine. And after each of those two accidents and a few others, the only thought in Dave's mind was, oh my goodness, I hope I can skydive again. And miraculously, he had been. He had made full recoveries, and he was back to skydiving each time. And so now, whenever he jumped out of a plane, he just felt so lucky. The plan for that evening's jump was for Dave to rotate them 360 degrees three separate times so Shirley could get a full look down across Houston and all over Texas and just kind of see the world around her from so high up in the air. And then whenever Dave noticed that they were at 5,000 feet using his wrist altimeter, which is basically like a watch that tells you how far you are from the ground, Dave would pull the ripcord, the main chute would deploy, and they would float gently down to the ground. And at first, that is how this jump went. After they exited the plane, they stabilized in the proper horizontal position with Shirley in front, her stomach pointing toward the ground, and Dave obviously right behind her, controlling the skydive. And then after a few seconds, Dave slightly changed his body position and began rotating them 360 degrees so Shirley could look down and see all the highways and cars and barns and houses and the city off in the distance. I mean, it's this spectacular view. And as you're falling through the sky, especially in the first few seconds of the jump, you can't tell that you're going super fast, but you're going over 120 miles an hour, which is called terminal velocity. It's literally the fastest you can fall in the air. And so you're blazing towards the ground, but it almost feels like the air is pushing you back up. And so Shirley's having this incredible first time experience, just really taking it all in. And Dave, even though he had done this hundreds of times, was having a wonderful time as well but Dave really was just focused on his altimeter because when they hit 5,000 feet, he needed to pull the parachute. And so they're cruising along, Dave's checking his altimeter over and over again, and then finally he sees 5,000 feet, he quickly looks around him to scan for any other jumpers, he's clear, and so he reached back and he pulled his ripcord handle for his main chute. Now, normally, when you deploy your main parachute, depending on what kind of parachute you're using, there's actually kind of a slow unfurling. It's not like suddenly the chute is deployed and then you just stop. That would not work. You'd get destroyed every time you skydive. So the way it's packed is it kind of unfurls slowly and it's like a gradual slowing down. But after Dave has pulled the ripcord handle, there was an immediate yank of the parachute backpack up and away from him. And then from somewhere above him, he heard a loud popping sound. Now, Dave had jumped enough times to know that this was not normal. There was a problem and he would be right. The main parachute had deployed out of the backpack, but it got tangled on the way out, and so it did not inflate at all, and so as a result, it was not slowing them down at all. But worse than that was this tangled up parachute was still attached to them, and it kind of became like a sail, and it turned Dave and Shirley onto their sides and began whipping them around in something called a death spiral, where literally you're just spinning so unbelievably fast that normally jumpers will actually lose consciousness. They're spinning so fast. But Dave, being a very experienced skydiver, he tried to stay calm. He tried to track his way out of this death spiral, which is when you put your arms and legs straight and try to go in a straight line through the air, but it didn't work. He just kept on spinning faster and faster, and at this point, Shirley, she's practically losing consciousness. She's yelling what's going on, and Dave is just trying to stay calm. He's still trying to get out of it, but he knows there's no way. But Dave remembers he has two knives, and so he decides he's going to cut away this tangled main chute and then deploy his reserve chute because you don't want to open your reserve 
directly into a tangled parachute. And so he reaches up, he's spinning, remember, he reaches up and he grabs the first knife. However, the lines of the tangled parachute had actually tangled on his shoulder strap where that first knife was. And so he literally couldn't get to the knife. And so now they're below 5,000 feet. They're at like 4,000, closing in on 3,000 feet. I mean, they're coming close to the ground here and they don't have a canopy. But Dave, he stays calm. They're spinning around. He can't get that first knife. And so he reaches for the second knife, which was placed in front of Shirley. But because of how quickly they were spinning, he couldn't quite get his arm out to grab the second knife. It was just impossible to grab it. And so without any other options, Dave had to pull his reserve chute, knowing it was going to go straight into this tangled mess right above them. And so the reserve chute, it deploys, and it does work, at least at first. There's that gradual slowing down sensation that Dave immediately feels. Their spin begins to stop, and for a second, it seems like they're going to be saved by this reserve chute, because by now, they're only about 2,000 feet from the ground. However, the worst-case scenario happens to Dave and Shirley. As soon as their reserve chute was up over their head, inflated, their main chute suddenly caught air and inflated as well. So they had two parachutes. Now, you can land with two parachutes, absolutely. However, sometimes, in a worst-case scenario, the two parachutes will catch wind going in opposite directions. So basically, the parachutes will go out to either side of the jumper or jumpers, if it's tandem, and then you basically have wings that aim the jumpers straight at the ground. It's like an accelerant. It causes them to literally speed up straight towards the ground. And once you start moving in this position, which is known as a down plane, it's almost impossible to get out of it because the faster you go, the more inflated these two parachutes become. And so Dave knows they are less than 2,000 feet from the ground. They're in a down plane, which is almost always fatal. And so all he can do is try to get out of the down plane. And so Dave, with all his might, he begins yanking on the different lines of both parachutes, and he manages to get them out of the down plane, which is nearly